What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're finally back with another Friday stream, the System Crafters live streams that we typically do every Friday, but we have skipped the last two weeks because of a uh, good reason, because I actually moved to another country. Uh, as some of you may know, um, over the last maybe a couple months, I've been uh, in the process of moving to Greece, and uh, that has finally happened, and I am here in Athens right now, um, staying with my wife's family but uh, you know we're, we're looking for a place to live and I've been having a lot of fun a lot of nice weather so far uh, it's been like uh, 24 25 Celsius which is like about 80 degrees Fahrenheit so pretty good sunshine you know can't uh, can't complain about that whenever I, you uh, go outside in Seattle around this time of year typically it's cold and wet so it's a nice uh, change from my previous uh, climate Nice to see everybody here today. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, let's see. Let me say hello to some people here. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at two different computers here, so I have to scroll on another another screen. Uh, Samuel Jackson, uh, Alejandro, Pavel, Rune, Ellis, John, Vitaly, Vladislav, Appenzel, uh, B. Uh, Kazinsky, I think. I'm sorry. Karthik. Hey, Karthik. Uh, Emmanuel, Ashraz, uh, Boyan, Jerry, Jafer. Take a Kootley. Let's see who else. I think there's uh, Benoit and Disseminates are also here from Twitch. Let's see what else. Yeah, thanks very much for the congrats on that. Let's see. Uh, yes, I'm I'm still working at my current employer. Samuel Jackson says currently in Seattle can confirm it's cold and wet. Yeah, it's definitely not ideal, but that's just me. I don't know. I prefer sunshine. GK Sudo says, nice to see you brought the System Crafters mug with you. Yeah, I had to uh, uh, smuggle that on the airplane in my hand luggage. I mean, I didn't smuggle it, but, you know, I had to make sure that it was well protected so it didn't get destroyed. Yuka says, uh, welcome to the EU. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very happy, actually. Mark says, ditto on the rain in Seattle. Yes, definitely. Yes, everything's going great. Uh, so... It took a little bit of adjustment, obviously because of jet lag, but also because of, um, uh, you know, you, you have to sort of get used to living somewhere. I mean, I've, I've stayed with my wife's parents a bunch of times. I've been here to Greece a bunch of times, but, you know, this time is different because we're not on vacation and I actually have to work every day at the same time. So I've been working the whole last week and it's been hard to sort of get my flow together to prepare for making videos and also prepare for streaming. So as you'll see, today's stream is a little bit rough, but that's just because I'm, you know, trying to get back into it. Um, I think it'll be fine, though. And there's a nice amount of people here, so that'll, that'll make it more fun. Uh, Jan says it's, it's cold and wet in Ibiza as well. Wow, I'm surprised about that. Edis is uh, throwing a nice pun into the mix. Uh, did you smuggle it? And yeah, basically. leaving the american dream uh leaving the u.s well i mean i guess you know i'm an american and my dream is not necessarily to be in the u.s i, I would like to live you know other places for a while and see how things go let's see what else is interesting um so i was trying all day today to get my old streaming laptop um reconfigured to the point where i could actually use it for the stream today and i didn't fully get there and the main reason why is because uh, recently I started converting my personal configuration over to Geek's Home, which uh, we talked about on a couple streams over like the last couple months. And uh, it works. I had a few things I had to, to work through, which is a little bit annoying, but um, it's, uh, it's cool to be able to replicate both the system and user level configuration on both machines. But I'm trying to work out all the kinks on how you would actually replicate that in practice. So... Uh, lately, um, uh, or let, I should say in the near future, I'll be talking more about Geeks Home, I think, because it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, if you are interested in Geeks at all, uh, you'll definitely want to check it out because it's a, another thing that Geeks can do that's pretty useful. 
Let's see, uh, Ellis says cold and wet in England. Oh, yeah, I'm not really surprised, to be honest. NYC is just cold. Let's see, Antonio says I hear you louder. Yeah, maybe I'm closer now. So uh, today, my plan really is just to have a sort of more relaxed stream and uh, catch up on some Emacs news because I've sort of been out of the loop for a few weeks. <clears throat> so uh, we're just going to go through a few different things that I came across while looking at uh, Satichua's Emacs news posts. You know, it's a good to uh, take from an already excellent resource and uh, use that instead of trying to go scour the internet, to find all these things myself. Uh, and if you don't know about uh, Emacs news, you should definitely check it out. Uh, let's see. I mean, if you just search the internet for Emacs news, I'm pretty sure it's like the first thing that comes up, but let's see. Yeah, so category Emacs news, of course it's the first link. But uh, yeah, just put this in your RSS feed. There's an RSS link here above, and uh, then you'll be on top of everything in the Emacs community because Sacha does an amazing job of uh, keeping everything up to date here. She probably has some automation of some sort. She probably has explained it at some, at some point it's, you know, on her blog or something. But all I do know is that it's very well organized and uh, everything you need to know about what's happening in the Emacs world is here. So that's basically what I did today. I just scanned through and found some things I thought were interesting so that we could talk about it here. Uh, Alejandro says, do you have in your plans to meet with uh, Protosilas? Well, I would like to definitely meet with uh, Protosilas, but uh, he's in Cyprus, and that's sort of like on another island from uh, from Greece itself, so I would have to fly over there. But, you know, well, I plan to do a lot of traveling, so Cyprus is definitely a place I would, I would, I would go. Uh, Boyuan says, uh, now less time difference for me at China. Yeah, well... That, that does raise a good point. You know, it is uh, 5.30 here in the evening in Greece. Usually whenever I'm in the U.S., I'm streaming around uh, 9 a.m. my time. Um, and, you know, streaming on Friday evening at 5 or 6 p.m. for two hours is kind of rough because, you know, it's, it's the evening, it's Friday, it's kind of like the end of the week. You want to just, you know, kick off your shoes and relax a little bit and having to uh, stream for two hours is not necessarily the most ideal thing. So I might try to shift the, the time a little bit, especially now that like the global time changes for daylight savings time are ending and uh, Greece already ended the last week. Yeah, this week the time change ended. So we, we jumped back one hour and then the US I think will jump back one hour next week. So all the timing for everything is getting kind of screwed up. But uh, the idea is that I might be moving the stream in general back one hour uh, from what it used to be, we'll see how it goes, but, um, yeah, it, I need to uh, sort of accommodate life here a little bit because it, it is late for, uh, for streaming on Friday, but we'll see what happens. Let's see. Ahmed says how to get completion in doom Emacs. Tried tab nine. No luck. Well, you should probably use, um, uh, LSP mode or something like that. Hey, Marduk. Mjolnir's Revenge, nice to see you. Or just Mjolnir. Ella says, we lost an hour, I'm still out of sync. Yeah, it, well, the, the the time changes are what are, what is really annoying. I mean, you know, it, it's actually worse too whenever you have jet lag and then you think you're supposed to be waking up at a certain time and then the clock goes backwards and then you have to like stay in bed one more hour when you can't sleep because you have jet lag. So a little bit annoying, but uh, you know, what can we do? I think people across the world are trying to eliminate daylight savings time, but uh, I don't know if people have been very successful with that yet. Pavel says one hour earlier would be perfect for me. Well, it might be perfect for, for you and me. We'll see how it goes. All right. So um, some some general news. This is the only slide I have today, but maybe, you know, if you think of things that you want to add to this list for me to talk about, uh, please feel free to chime in. Um, I'll go through this stuff and then we can talk about more things that may have come up while I've been out. Get the call. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, so first of all, the, the biggest thing that sort of happened in the last couple of weeks is that the uh, Emacs Conf schedule has been posted. And uh, I actually don't have that pulled up, but let me see if I can pull it up really quickly. But there's probably some names on there that you recognize uh, for the different um, talks. Let's see. Emacs Conf 2021. Let's see if I can pull that up really quickly. Lots of talks this year, which is great. Um, let's see, where is the program? There it is. So I'll throw this in the mix. Uh, let's see, 
let me just do that really quickly yeah and then i'll put it put it in the chat too okay so uh there's a couple people from the System Crafters community here, which is great. There's uh, Case and uh, Daniel Rose, both uh, submitted some talks. I'm glad, really glad that they got uh, selected. Then you got people like you know Bastian and uh, Stefan Manier and uh, uh, Pical, also Philip here. Let's see who else do we recognize? Uh, Carl Voigt. Probably some other people I should be recognizing, but you know sometimes people go by internet handles and not by their main name or their real name, so you can't really tell who is who sometimes. You have uh, Nicholas Rouget and uh, Andrea. Uh, Pratt is giving a talk at the end of the first day. Uh, Dimitri Gutov is giving a talk. Let's see. Another talk by Stefan Manier. This one actually is pretty cool. It's basically like a way to decode binary data built into Emacs. There's like a library for it, which is pretty cool. Um, Andrea Corallo is going to talk about the uh, Emacs Lisp native compilation progress, which is great, and also maybe some future developments. So I'm very uh, interested to hear that, actually. And then at the very end of the second day, I'll be giving the talk that I've been been mentioning here and there, the uh, Meta X Forever, Why Emacs Will Outlast uh, Text Editor Trends. So thankfully, my talk got accepted as well. I still have to record it and give it to them. I haven't done that yet, and the deadline was supposed to be this weekend. So I'm going to have to go and beg for forgiveness and then try to uh, get it done for next weekend. But I think it'll be fine. Uh, I'm very excited about being a part of this, though, because there's a lot of, you know, really uh, smart and capable people here in this list. Uh, Sacha Chua, obviously, obviously included, um, giving the Emacs News highlights for the year. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a great event. So that's going to be on the 27th and the 28th of November, Saturday and Sunday. For those of you in the U.S., uh, that's like Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, for those of you in the rest of the world, it's just, you know, any other weekend, I suppose. Um so yeah, it should be pretty fun. So definitely check that out. I think all the talks are pre-recorded, but some of them will have live Q&A sessions afterward. Mine should have one as well. I don't actually know what time of day my talk is supposed to be. Let's see, does it say? Uh, it does not say what time. So we'll have to see what time it ends up being, but um, yeah, it'll be at the end of the second day, so you'll just have to wait around and see when that ends up being. I, I might, you know, uh, put out a ping on uh, the Discord and IRC and maybe Twitter whenever it's about to come up, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Imaginary programming is the name of a talk. That's basically what I do every day at my day job. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, not doing real programming. I'm just doing imaginary programming. All right. Uh, Crazy Chicken says Emacs will outlive us all. Well, I, I would say it's likely. Um, out of any programs in the world, Vim and Emacs probably have the greatest uh, likelihood of living forever. Let's see. All right. So another big piece of news that happened while I was out is that EXWM finally got a new maintainer. So I'm going to pull up this uh, email from the Emacs Devel list. And let me know in the chat if you end up seeing any problems with the... Um, the stream because I don't know what the internet situation is like right now. So, um, uh, Stefan Manier says in uh, the Emacs Devel list that is that the, uh, the the maintainer of EXWM is not responding to their Gmail account nor participating in the EXWM GitHub site anymore. It's been going on for quite a while now, making it necessary to consider a replacement maintainer at the very least on a temporary basis. And uh, basically asking if anybody knows how to contact him. And uh, specifically, they're talking about, uh, uh, I think his name is Chris Fang, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they say, in the meantime, uh, uh, Adrian Medrano Calvo is going to take over as the acting maintainer. And if you have spent any time on the EXWM repo, you might recognize uh, Adrian's name because he's been sort of like a kind of a co-maintainer on the project for a while. So uh, he's going to basically do some part-time maintenance on the project and if you've been paying attention you might have seen that uh a 0 0.25 release of exwm got released maybe last week if i'm not mistaken um so it's very good to know that we're going to get some you know bug fixes merged in and uh, new releases uh pushed out this new release does actually contain a few fixes for issues that have been lingering for a while not necessarily some of the ones that i've been looking into but other ones that there had been patches for in the past. Like, I guess the state that we were in is that the main maintainer, Chris, 
had done a lot of fixes for various things, but never really merged them in because he was waiting for people to give feedback and make sure there's no bugs that came up with these fixes. And uh, Adrian has been been merging them in and then you know preparing a release to to uh, put some of these out. So uh, that's great news. I'm very happy about that because you know. Uh, we don't want EXWM to go away. Those of us who actually use EXWM every day for you know our workflow. So uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to contribute directly to the project. You know, I had that stream a while back talking about you know the future of EXWM and you know whether anybody will maintain it or if it sort of just sort of dies and we need to do something as a community. Uh, now that somebody's there to deal with merging pull requests and you know responding to issues and whatnot i feel more confident in trying to con contribute to the project directly so uh, whenever i get my paperwork set up to contribute to emacs which i'm going to try to do soon um, i'll be able to make contributions to that and then hopefully we'll be able to get back to the hack streams i was doing where i was looking into issues for exwm and uh, we can all sort of learn more about how to contribute to that project to uh, give it a longer life uh, so yeah, so at the end of this message, anyone interested in helping the development and maintenance of that nice package should contact, uh, Adrienne. So definitely do that. If you're interested in contributing, now's the time because, uh, somebody will actually be there to merge the PRs. So that's great. Uh, Benoit says my webcam freezes is choppy quite a bit. Yeah. I'm not surprised. The, so I did a speed test on this internet yesterday and it was like, 70 megabit down and about 10 megabit up solid like it did not drop at all and i did a speed test right before the stream and it was just going up and down both for downstream and upstream so i'm not exactly sure what's going on with the internet today but hopefully it's uh okay i see the feed of the stream on another computer here so it seems okay disseminate says what if any videos do you have planned for geeks in the future i don't have anything planned to the extent that I know exactly what it's going to be, but I know that in general, I'm going to be covering uh, strategies for doing your user level configuration with geeks. Um, but my, my thinking on that has changed since I started using geeks home. Previously, I had uh, set up sort of like a multiple profile situation where you could have like an Emacs profile, a desktop application profile, you know, profiles for other types of tools that you use. But now that Geeks Home has come along, um, I think it's better to try to show how to use that. But the difficulty there, I guess, not really so much of a difficulty as it is a extra detail, is that uh, at the current moment, it does require a little bit more familiarity writing Guile Scheme and writing, you know, Geeks Code, basically. Uh, because there's not a lot of services written for Geeks Home yet that, that do things that you might want to do. So in a lot of cases, you may have to write some of your own stuff for configuring programs that you use. So uh, I do want to try to cover Guile Scheme. That's one of the things I, I want to do in the short term is actually start talking about Guile Scheme in, in more depth, teaching how to write code in that. And then we can use that to as a jumping off point to talk about uh, Geeks Home and also maybe even writing more code for Geeks itself, like packaging um, applications, writing uh, system level services, you know, getting more into the nitty gritty details of writing a system configuration. The, the nice thing about uh, Geeks Home and uh, using Geeks for system management is that a lot of the same concepts apply. So if you learn how to write stuff for Geeks Home, it does sort of spill into Geeks system as well. So. That's sort of what we want to do is um, go into Geeks again, but have a little bit of background in Guile Scheme, because really, if you want to use Geeks the way it's meant to be used, you need to learn uh, how to use Guile Scheme. Hey, Alex. Nice to see you, man. All right. So uh, other random things that I found in the Emacs News feed... Uh, first of all, something that's kind of interesting, maybe you don't care too much about this, but um, I've actually tried to do this a few times myself with various packages and have had varying levels of, of success. And that is um, emojis in Emacs. And, uh, you know, ah, there we go. I didn't realize I had Discord open still. <clears throat> so uh, love it or hate it, uh, emojis are a part of our world and it's how people uh, express themselves in a lot of different places, either through email or IRC or, uh, you know, Telegram or anything like that. Why is this not opening? No link found. Did I really not put a link in here? It's there, dude. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Come on. Open it. 
Ah, okay, good. Finally. Uh, what did I do? Uh oh. There we go. Did it hang for a second? Fun. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to make sure we don't lock up my EXWM session today. So, uh, this blog post is by Lars uh, Ingebrigtsen, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And it's basically about how um, I think Lars worked on getting. Uh, getting, sorry, I, I'm seeing some stuttering in the stream over on the other windows, so it's a little bit distracting right now. Uh, getting e uh, emoji support working in Emacs uh, built in. So previously there's been packages, um, Emojify is one of those packages that actually allows you to uh, use emojis or like pick emojis, but it doesn't really put real emojis in Emacs because it uses images that it inserts into the buffer. So it's kind of cheating a little bit so is you're not using real emojis from a font in your system uh, however there's other packages like there's a unicode fonts package that can make it possible for you to use real uh, unicode emoji fonts in emacs but uh, when i've used that i've had trouble with it at various times even to the point where it crashed emacs so um, it did work but it was a little bit flaky so now we actually have the ability to do uh emojis directly in Emacs with some of the more recent changes in Emacs 28.1. So in the new stable release that's going to come out in the next few months, you're going to see actual emoji support, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it, it is color emojis and not just, you know, plain, you know, black and white emojis, which is great. So I don't know exactly what is necessary to make emoji support support work in Emacs, but um, you know, it's probably a lot of uh, Unicode stuff that's necessary. And it's great to see that uh, Lars has gone through the trouble to do this. I think, was it Lars who did it? Yeah. I think there was someone else who had written something that he mentioned here. But uh, since Transient is also now brought into uh, Emacs as a core package, I believe, uh, we have a Transient that can be used for selecting emojis, which is pretty nice. So that's that's pretty cool. I think I can hear my daughter screaming in the background. Sorry about that. Let's see. I think he mentioned someone else's name here. I can't remember where it was. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm thinking of something else. But uh, but yeah, so you can see here in this little uh, animation that you can use emojis for your code if you want to type you know funny little function names in your Emacs packages to make it hard for anybody else to work on them with you. Uh, you could definitely do that. So this is the uh, watermelon fox function that takes some kind of nuclear uh, input. So... Maybe if you're uh, Doc Brown and you're getting plutonium from the uh, for, from whoever nice people he was getting plutonium from, this would be a function you could use to to pass that plutonium. Huh? Let's see. Uh, GK Pseudo says I've had a few Emacs crashes with emojis in the mode line from Emojify. Yeah, definitely it can be um, tricky, but uh, it it does. It stands to, or I guess it's worth mentioning that it is good to have emojis available because you can use it in places like the mode line or in other places like, let's say, org agenda buffers or anywhere else that you have control over uh, text that gets displayed in Emacs. So if you want to liven up your Emacs experience a little bit, you can um, uh, you can use that. And Pavel mentions uh, Emojify is fun to enable and compile buffers and such. It usually finds emojis there. Yeah, or it interprets things as emojis and it gives you a lot of really weird stuff like smiley faces inside of your uh, your text output. Milliner says, I think I was reading about this a bit on the mailing list at some point. Glad to see it actually got implemented. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, these days you kind of need to have emojis, especially whenever you can do things like chat and email inside of Emacs. If you don't have good emoji support, then you're sort of missing out on uh, some core functionality for communication, I think. Okay, so uh, we've also seen a rash of new packages um, in the Emacs community. Um, and actually a couple that are in the area of uh, completion systems. Uh, there's one by uh, Protosilaus, which is called mct.el, and another one called Elmo by, uh, by Karthik. And uh, I, I know that in Karthik's blog post, he says don't use Elmo, but I think it's, it's worth talking about just because he you know spent the time to write uh, the code and uh, as well as write a blog post about it. So we're going to look, take a look at both of those. We might try them, but I'm not sure I haven't like prepared to try anything yet. So we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, Ashra says, uh, Lars mentioned someone in this article, if I recall. Yeah, I, I thought I saw it too, but you know, I'm in stream mode and I'm, I'm sort of glossing over things as I scroll through, so. Uh, Luis says, I'll finally uh, be able to send emojis in Telegat, Telegat.el. Yeah, that's another place where it's kind of nice. By the way, Luis, I did see the same issue that you saw in, with Geeks Home. Uh, the code that I have in my repo is out of date. So I tried to update Geeks today and I had the same issue where the bash profile parameter is different now. You actually have to pass in a, uh, a file type object there. So yeah, had the same problem. Uh, so let's take a look at the blog post that uh, Prot made for mct.el. And uh, mct is kind of like when I hear mct, it just makes me think of uh, mct oil, like the, what is it? The medium chain triglycerides or whatever it is. I'm not all up on the whole, you know, nutrition thing, but it's something that I did hear about at some point in the past. Uh-oh. Keep seeing the stream kind of fade a little bit. Hopefully it's going to stay up. Okay, so, um, so the idea behind this package is that in uh, the completion buffer of Emacs 28, um, there is something that allows you to make them vertically aligned. Make the presentation and overall functionality be consistent with other popular vertically aligned completion ideas UIs while leveraging built-in functionality. So it's just another way to take the new functionality that's getting put into the uh, the core code of Emacs and um, leveraging more of what's in the box, but still adding some extra behavior on top. We've been seeing this already with things like Vertico. Vertico def definitely takes advantage of some of the new stuff that's in Emacs 28. In fact, I think uh, Daniel Mendler, who works on Vertico, has been contributing things to Emacs to make this easier. So I think there's a lot of um, rethinking over time of completions in Emacs because new functionality is being added and then people are realizing that they can use more of what's in the box. So I think what Prot's doing here is uh, simplifying uh, you know, a layer on top of that. But like I said, I have not tried this at all and I have not watched Prot's video about this. So I don't know anything other than just what's being read on this page right now. So um, let's see. So MCT tries to find a middle ground between the frugal defaults and the more opinionated completion UIs. This is most evident in its approach on how to present completion candidates instead of showing them outright or only displaying them on demand. MCT implements a minimum input threshold as well as a slight delay before it pops up the completions buffer and starts updating it to respond to user input. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it sounds like it's, it's more meant to not be in your face because like, for instance, if you, you know, hit, you know, council buffer or console buffer, you know, you, you get a list of stuff immediately. Um, but some people don't necessarily like that. It, you, it makes sense because if you pop up a completion, like a vertical completion list, it changes your window configuration, or at least it moves things around. And sometimes it causes things to recalculate in Emacs. And maybe you really don't want that to show a completion list yet until you really want it to. Um, for me though, Vertico is, you know, kind of like ideal. I just like the way it looks. It sort of clicks for me. So, uh, I, I do respect the fact that other people want to try other strategies and, you know, I may be swayed to those at some point in the future, but at least for now, uh, you know, the, the Vertico style makes sense to me. Um, let's see. So let me just take a look at the GitLab repo for this project. And I might try to pull it up really quickly just to see what happens, but, uh, it may not work for me. A lot of de details here, very well written, as you would expect. Um, installation. So, oh, okay. So it looks like we have to pull it from the repo directly. We can do that with straight, no problem. Acquire MCT, MCT mode on. There's some, also some options you can set. So let's see. Let me see if I can pull up my uh, my bare Emacs config and try this out. So Emacs, oh, hmm. Maybe this will work. Let's see, Emacs. Hopefully this doesn't break everything in the stream. With profile. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh, we're building straight now. It's gonna bring down the stream. Uh, let's see, Emacs, pull it over here. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see, Ellis says, uh, if I recall, Minad said that he isn't contributing to Emacs anymore because of the hassle and the red tape. Uh, well, it depends on what 
red tape you're referring to if you mean just you know the general um i i know that minad well no i'm not sure if minad has the ability to contribute directly to emacs i think he does yeah good i'm glad this loaded up and didn't give us any trouble um, yeah, the red tape may just be like the, the review process and how slow it is sometimes to maybe get things in, but generally Emacs, you know, is a pretty conservative project, which makes sense because you've got so many people using Emacs over so many years that they're reluctant to make, uh, you know, breaking changes. Let's see. Thanks, Emmanuel. All right. So, whoa, my other screen went dead. He has copyright assignment, just the general Emacs Devel red tape. Yeah, I have not experienced that myself yet, but you know, any any big project is going to have some level of uh, slowness to getting new changes in. I think. All right, so use package. Um, I don't remember the actual syntax for this right now, but we'll figure it out. Um, what is it? straight no sorry mct uh repo i think i can just do let's try this and let me also go to my own emacs config really quick hey eric i have to remember the syntax for um pulling repos let's see that's all I need right there. So host GitLab in this case. We're just going to give this a quick try and see if it works. Let me make sure I didn't screw that up. Whoops. Emacs.org. Um, yeah, I think that's right. We'll see if it works. In a file during parsing. What did I do wrong? Oh, I need to get back into... Come on, EXWM reset. Uh, toggle input. I forgot what key binding I have set up on this. It's been a while. Okay, there we go. Wrong type argument symbol P. What am I looking at? I'm in the help buffer. Let's see. I don't have a, like a normal straight install in here anymore. Maybe I should just do this straight use package. Sorry for the... Jeez. You can tell I'm rusty on this, right? I have my nice little configuration set up and it's, uh, there we go. Thanks case. Yeah. Straight use package works better for this. There's flies in here, man. It's driving me nuts. So it was super I. Okay. Forgot about that. All right. Cloning MCT. Cool. Now it's working. We're building MCT. So, um, I'm going to turn off vertigo and then I'm going to turn on MCT mode. Okay, so if I were to use meta X and start typing V-E-R-T, then we get a, oh, okay, that's pretty nice. So, whoa, okay. It, my uh, normal key bindings don't work there, obviously. So let's see, uh, V-E-R. And then was like meta N, nah, interesting. Well, it, it has a nice looking UI. I mean, it looks sort of like what you'd see from uh, Vertigo, et cetera, but it, it doesn't do anything until you start typing something. So like, let's say world clock or display world clock. Okay, so I can use the arrow keys to navigate that. That's cool. All right. So let's see, what else is interesting to try? There's a few settings that Prot recommends somewhere here. So things like high completion mode line that's interesting. Show completion line numbers. Apply completion stripes. What is that? 
Okay, let's just, you know, copy this. Remove shadowed file names. I uh, also should try it with a uh, find file and see what that looks like. Let's see. Completions format, one column. Hmm. Let me see about uh, MCT completions format. What's it just, just say? It's one column by default. Ah, uh, completions format. Interesting. So this is something new in Emacs, apparently. Wait, no. In Emacs 23. Okay. So you can ha have horizontal, one column, etc. That's interesting. So if I were to go and paste in this stuff that I copied, um, let's try show completion line numbers nil okay cool yeah let's eval region on that cool now let's use uh find file maybe so dot dot files okay oh yeah okay i, I see what the striped means now it looks is, is it sort of like helm does helm do that i think i remember that I mean, it's it's pretty attractive looking, I, I would say. Um, let's see if I hit tab in my .config folder. Yeah, it just has like a little bit of a delay, but I think that's built in. In fact, uh, live update delay, let's see. What does that say? So originally 0 0.6, no, 0 0.3. All right, so delay in section before updating the completions buffer set to zero to disable the delay. Let's try that. What happens if we do that? So um, VER, okay, so it pops up faster because it's not, I think the reason why there's a delay sort of built in is because sometimes it does take time to generate the list of completion options. Um, so it makes sense if you want your completions to be a little bit faster because you probably want to type like, you know, verdict, then, you know, have it show up later after you've typed a little bit of text. Uh, minimum input, what does that say? Can you set it to zero? V value greater than one can help reduce the total number of candidates that are being computed. Yeah, I'm not gonna bother with that. But uh, it is kind of nice um, what I'm seeing here. Is there any other benefit of using this? Um, black Block list can be used for commands with lots of candidates depending on how low the minimum input is. So things like describe symbol, describe function, etc. I don't really have a problem with those though with Vertico. I mean, I, I run it and it, you know, it loads them up, but um, I'm wondering if it's doing some asynchronous stuff in the background that makes it seem a little bit faster. Uh, Case says, as far as I know, the delay is zero because Prot doesn't like the distractions. You can set it to zero. Yeah, definitely seems to be the case. This is for commands that should always pop up the completions buffer. So basically, instead of waiting for you to type, you can have specific commands that will always uh, give you the completion list. So Definitely gives you some more control over which one of uh, which commands will pop things up uh, automatically, or if maybe you have to start typing a certain number of characters. And then it seems you can uh, customize the display buffer action, so you can control where the buffer shows up, which is kind of nice. Um, and then some extra configuration options that uh, are basically Emacs configurations, um, which apply to MCT because mainly MCT is building on top of the built-in uh, completion stuff in Emacs. So a lot of stuff that you could change here if you wanted to. Uh, has its own key maps. And let's see. So yeah, if you use it with uh, consult, embark, marginalia, the, all those kinds of things, I mean, it, it works with those very well. And also he mentions alternatives and gives some r rationale beh behind why you would use MCT versus any of these other ones. He even mentions uh, Elmo here by Karthik, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I would definitely recommend checking it out if you're interested in something that's a little bit different. Um, and maybe it's more your style if you want to have things be less in your face, like with, you know, other completion frameworks that automatically just pops up in front of you. You know, you could have more control over that. Maybe you could do the same thing with Vertico too, um, but you would have to look into the extensions of Vertico, and I haven't really looked very much into those yet. See you, Luis. Let's see. Um, all right, so that was cool. We got to try that out really quickly. I mean, it's a 
you know, it worked no problem, which is great. I, I think one thing we should point out, though, is that uh, marginalia mode was turned on. So that did control the fact that uh, you were seeing some extra information be displayed in the second column, I guess you could say, of this, of this listing. So um, by default, you would not see all that same information. Uh, but since I do have marginalia mode turned on uh, in my configuration here, it um, it caused some extra things to show up. So that, that explains why you get all the documentation strings there. Hey, welcome, man. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, let's see. All right, so we covered that one. So let's also take a look at uh, Elmo, which I think has a different purpose uh, entirely. I don't know if Karthik is still here. Let's see. I have to remember my key bindings for everything. Come on. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, Elmo is another package that provides a certain type of um, completion interface on top of the stuff that's already built into Emacs. If I can get it to load, it'd be nice. Whoops, I clicked that by accident. Not ready for you yet. Go away. All right, here we go. So Elmo stands for Embark Live Mode for Emacs. So as we were talking about in the last stream we did, uh, the many uses of Embark, um, I mentioned that some people have used Embark as a uh, completion system because it has the ability to do live updating of, re of results. So what Karthik has done here is take some code, I believe that he worked on with Omar, who's the author of uh, Embark, that you know provides a more completion system style interface for Embark and uh, made it into a package. So basically because Prot released uh, MCT mct.el, Karthik decided to package up some similar code uh, that he had lying around that uses the Embark live collect buffers as an incremental completion system for Emacs. So basically it does the same thing as other completion systems, allows you to select candidates by typing in stuff at the mini buffer. So if we press play on this video here, it shows us that um, it does a similar thing where it delays a little bit at first and while you start typing in characters They will start giving you um, completions that you can select from and it seems you can also have different layouts for the completions Where they start out as a sort of horizontal list, but you could also have a vertical style list that has the marginalia information as well I'm not sure if uh, MCT does the same thing uh, so one thing Karthik says is that Elmo is similar to MCT, but it does not require Emacs 28 so um, <clears throat> Prot's code definitely requires some code that is new in Emacs 28, so that's one difference here. Uh, it seems like there's some drama going on in the house here. Um, so Elmo is idiosyncratic. It does not show completions until you type some characters. It debounces completion candidate updates. It shows certain categories of completions in a grid. Um, and it also says Elmo is slow. Use Selectum or Vertico or IV or iComplete instead. My primary reason for turning it into a minor mode from a gaggle of hooks is that I can now turn it off. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I mean, you have a lot of custom code you write. If you want to be able to turn it on and off, make a minor mode. And if you've gone to that amount of trouble, you might as well just, you know, ship the package so other people can try it too. So, you know, once again, you are warned not to use Elmo, but because I don't listen to what other people have to say and, you know, because I... I trust Karthik's ability to write packages. I'm going to try it out and see what happens. Uh, but le let me see if I can find where it actually lives. Do I have a link to the repo here? I'm guessing it's going to be on Karthik's GitHub profile. Um, let's see, github.com slash Karthik. Yeah, very nice uh, creaky chair that I'm sitting on here as well, which is really fun for the audio. All right, Embark Live Mode for Emacs. Looks like I've already started, so there you go. Um, so we'll try to pull this in to this uh, Emacs config. Wow, this thing is way behind in the chat. Or it just wasn't scrolled. Okay. So uh, let's go back to Emacs, and we're going to say straight use package, um, Elmo repo, uh, carthink slash Elmo, and then uh, host GitHub. And that ought to be enough. Uh, bum, 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 bum. What don't you like? What did I do wrong here? Entering debugger. Oh, pff. I forgot an R here. Straight. Straight. Use package. All right. 
cloning Elmo. Benoit says, did I miss anything? Yeah, we, we solved all the, the problems with Emacs while you're gone. So you'll have to play back and, and see what happened. Okay, so Elmo got loaded here. Uh, let's turn off MCT mode. And let's turn on Elmo mode, I guess. Okay. So similarly, if we start typing, uh, let's try VERT. And we do get a similar interface. Uh, I don't think I have Vertigo on, so this should be the right... Uh... Oh boy, my daughter is really not happy. That's, that's one of the problems with uh, flying internationally with kids is that uh, jet lag just drives them insane. All right, so ICO. So it, it is updating uh, dynamically, which is nice. Uh, I'm using my arrow keys and it doesn't seem to be moving between selections in a buffer, but I don't know if that's part of what the, it's supposed to do. Uh, maybe if I move, well, no, that doesn't work. Okay. B-E-R-T. Um, so is there any extra benefit to this using Embark? Is there like a functionality that we can key into here? I have Embark turned on, but I don't think I have it bound to anything at the moment. Let's see, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Karthik says, you folks are incorrigible tinkerers. Well, you know, we're using Emacs, dude. I mean, the people who come here to this stream are all people who are just going and playing with their Emacs config all day. So, you know, you're at the right place for people who are not going to listen to your, uh, your warnings. Okay, so... Let's see, what else does Karthik have to say on this uh, readme? What is Elmo good at? It does the usual stuff you expect from an incremental completion system for Emacs. Here are some differences. Uh, no completion list until you type a minimum number of characters. Yep. Uh, use all your regular buffer commands. Here is a rectangle command. Okay. So it's just a buffer, I guess you say. Const line, go to line. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening there. Hold on. Oh, okay. You ran console line. Okay. Not sure what's happening. Switch on the fly between a list of, and a grid of candidates. Is that... Okay, that was a rectangle selection, it seems. Collect direct action minor mode. Interesting. Oh, yeah, it's switching between grids, grid and, and vertical. Uh, Karthik says you can turn on Embark Direct uh, Action Minor Mode. Okay, so Control N, Control P to move. Thank you. See, this is why it's nice to have authors of packages here so I don't have to read the readme and figure out how things work. They can just tell me in the chat. It's great. So uh, V-E-R-T, so Control N, P. Whoa. Okay, Evil Mode is causing us problems here, so... Definitely need to turn off evil mode for that to work. Whoops. Turn off evil mode. Thank you. Now let's try that again. Ugh. Wow, what is happening right now? Okay, so VERT, control N, P. Whoa. I turned off evil. Why is this still happening? Whatever. No time for that. Turn on evil mode. See a millionaire. There we go. Okay. All right. So here we are. Key bindings. Uh, okay. Meta queue to toggle between a list and a grid. I like that uh, key binding because it's sort of like, um, yeah, there we go. So that's cool. Sort of like, you know, the fill buffer binding, whatever the uh, command is. Uh, control L to toggle the completions. Control L. Ah, okay, that's cool. You can hide them if you want to. Uh, you can export with control meta L. Uh, control S to I search as well as any other regular command you use. Interesting. Okay, so that actually probably makes it easier. So if you use uh, VRT and then control S, you can search inside. Ah, is that console line? No, it doesn't work. Apparently my uh, control S binding is a little bit too aggressive. Tweak as necessary. Min input, always show list, initial delay, update delay. Okay. So um, 
Yeah, so this basically just uses Embark for a similar thing. And I'm not sure, you know, aside from, you know, things that, you know, Karthik shows here, I'm not sure what else, the what other benefits there may be for using Embark for this purpose. But, you know, for my purposes, just using Vertico and having Embark as a binding or Embark Act as a binding is, is good enough to uh, make it and make Embark really useful inside of uh, completion lists. Uh, okay, so that's those two completion systems. And uh, they're like, like, like I said, there's more new packages being created every day. Uh, but right now, we're actually going to take a little side track and talk about this article that Karthik made about uh, Avi. I don't know if you've heard of the package called Avi, but it's another package by uh, Abo Abo who um, wrote Ivy and Swiper. And uh, what else did Abo Abo write? Ace Window, I think. Um, and it's it's pretty amazing. It's very nice for being able to jump around in buffers or even um, any visible window on the screen. And typically, the way that you do that is by running an AVI command that allows you to type any letter that you may see on the screen. And then it allows you to gradually narrow to move your cursor to wherever you're typing um, on the screen. So if I were to give you a quick example of that, I have AVI installed. So I'm in this buffer right now. I go to uh, Avi, what is it called? Avi go to care timer. So I press enter here and I, let's say I type uh, C. I wanna uh, get to that, that C right here on the screen. Now it gives me some overlay in the buffer where I can type in LA and it jumps the cursor. Well, where is the cursor? Ah, it, it is there. It just took a while for it to blink again. So Ella says, if it's IV, shouldn't it be IV2 or AV? M maybe. I don't know. Is that how it's supposed to be? I had never thought about it before. But uh, anyway, if you didn't see what just happened, I'm going to press it to enter again. I'm going to jump to this I right here. I'll press I, and then I'll press uh, LH, and then it allows me to jump right to that location on the screen. So basically, it allows you to navigate to whatever your eyeballs are looking at on the screen, which is kind of nice because sometimes you don't want to have to use the navigation keys to move around and it's easier to just say, okay, I'm looking at this letter. Let me just type some keys and get myself directly to that letter. So uh, Avi basically gives you the ability to do that. And uh, this blog post that Karthik wrote is basically about all the different ways that you can use Avi for other things. Uh, I will say that I have not gone through this in great detail yet, but it does give a lot of uh, nice, um, use cases as well as a pretty nice way to explain it. So sort of like the the blog post that Karthik wrote about Embark, uh, this one also sort of gives you the mental framework for how to think about using Avi. Uh, so basically there's, there's a common pattern that you see in Emacs where you sort of filter down a list of items, you select an item to act on, and then you, then you basically select the action. Um, but let's see, what's the next part of that? So yeah, this whole filter select act workflow there. And I think Avi helps with that. So I'm not going to go through the, and read Karthik's post to, to you. You should read it yourself. But the idea here is that he's showing how to use Avi for making this a little bit more easy. So um, it's a Avi is a, a new Emacs package for jumping to visible text using a care-based decision tree. See you, Ashraz. So let's see. Typing in one of the hints jumps to the cursor of that location. Yes, definitely. Um, let's see. Let's go to the cool stuff. Uh, Avi's documentation leaves out the best part. Avi handles filtering automatically and the selection is made through a care-based decision tree. Here's how it fits, fits into our three-part interaction model. So uh, before you call Avi, every text character on your screen is a potential candidate for selection. Um, let's see. You filter the candidate pool with Avi similar to how you would in the mini buffer by typing text. So yeah, it's sort of like fuzzy matching against things or... Uh, filtering down based on the substring that you're typing currently. Filtering in AVI is independent of the selection method. Um, let's see. Uh, in, in this piece, we're interested in a different, much less explored aspect of AVI. So, yeah, I think he's basically saying how you can use it for selections. So jumping the things makes it sound like a contextually faster eye search, but jumping is one of many possibilities. Avi also provides a dispatch list, a collection of actions you can perform on a candidate 
and they are all treated with equal footing with the jump action. So it's sort of like another way to do certain actions on something that you select on screen, which is pretty cool. So let's see. Uh, Abby also defines a few commands that run different actions like copying text from anywhere on screen. Let's see, what is the thing that pulls this dispatch list up? Okay, anytime you use Avi with question marks. So let's actually try that really quickly. I'm gonna run uh, Avi, go to care timer. I'll press question mark, zero candidates. It doesn't do anything yet, but if I were to type uh, I, no. Okay, let's just try that again. I'll run Avi, go to care timer. I'll type K and then question mark. So let's see, teleport, mark, copy, yank. Interesting. So let's just say uh, Y for yank. And then I'll type in uh, interesting uh, D. Huh. So basically the text at that location gets yanked and placed into the current cursor location. So you're sort of like dropping text from another location into the current location, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. Because if you're doing some editing in a file and you want to grab some text from one location, typically what you have to do is move your cursor to where that text is or use eye search or something to move your cursor there, select the text and then uh, copy it and then go paste it in the previous location. So you have to jump back to the previous location and paste it. Uh, here it just allows you to yank that text directly without even having to move your cursor, which is pretty awesome. So let's see what else we can do with that. Um, there's text here that's in a link. So if I were to say, uh, go to care timer, type in S to go there, question mark. Yeah, it doesn't give me any new actions, but what does teleport do? I'm gonna press T and I'll press KF. Oh, wow, so it does a similar thing where it's copying things. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here, but let's see. So there's more stuff in the dispatch list that uh, Karthik has. I don't know if maybe there's some actions that he added himself to, to do this. So, and maybe even plugging in Embark, that would be interesting. Abby actions. So kill a candidate word, uh, S expression or line. Uh, move a word or line. Zap to a candidate position. So basically delete all text between the current cursor location and the selected position, I think. Mark a candidate word, word or, exp or S expression. Mark the region from the point to a candidate, okay. Uh, I spell a word, if you need to check spelling on something. Define a word, I kinda like that. Cause uh, I need to use that sometimes. Um, look up the documentation for a symbol. Google search for a word. So basically you could do a lot of things that you would have to move your cursor to do, but without having to move your cursor, you're sort of like just, you know, point at the place where you want things to be done uh, effectively with the Avi searching strategy. Highlight occurrences. Okay, so you can use Avi plus Embark together, which is kind of interesting. So how does that work? Call Avi, go to care timer, type in FLO, run Avi action Embark. So does that, yeah, that doesn't exist here. Is that something that Karthik uh, made? Table of context available if you click the hamburger menu. Now you're making me hungry. Uh, let's see, where is that defined? Do you have that in this document somewhere? Avi action embark. Yeah, here it is. So go to care point and then embark act. Cool, so that's pretty simple. I mean, you're basically just creating another function that can take the point that Avi gives you and then use embark there uh, at that location. So you're basically putting Avi and Embark together, which sounds pretty awesome, to, to be honest. So yeah, this is a, lo a long post. It's got a lot of information in it. Um, I believe that it is um, very worthwhile to go read this because this is another one of those workflow improvement tricks that might help you get around a lot faster in your buffers or jumping between windows and stuff because Avi allows you to do this pretty easily. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons Karthik wrote this post, if I'm not mistaken, is to talk about like remembering to do it, remember to use Avi because you have this tool available to you, but you, you won't really like remember to work it into your work workflow unless you really you know consciously try to do it. And this has been my problem. I have Avi installed. I've had it installed for a long time, but I never use it because I just forget that it's there. So I think there's some uh, some 
suggestions here basically on how you can do that but um <laughs> and someone comments are you a wizard sir this post and the one on embark have changed how i see emacs yeah they're, they're very good posts you should definitely uh subscribe to karthik's rss feed i believe karthik has an rss feed don't you yeah at any rate definitely check out karthik's blog uh, especially this post on avi and also the aforementioned one about embark because there's some really good tips in those um, all right, so another package, Vertico Post Frame. So uh, if you've ever used Ivy before, you've probably come across this idea of um, using a what's called a post frame, or really it's like a child frame for um, displaying your completions list, not as part of the current frame, but as a sort of a pop-up frame on top of your current frame. Um, it is, uh, it, I used it for a while, it was kind of nice. <clears throat> but I did have some trouble with it with EXWM. But if you did like that in the past, I think the original author of uh, PostFrame and Ivy PostFrame, who is Tumashu, or Tumashu, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce the name, uh, has made a version of this for Vertico. So uh, that's a nice thing to have if you want to get that same behavior back. And I think people had been asking about that for a while. Uh, Daniel did try to make something like that for Vertico. I think it was called Mini Pop-Up. And um, it wasn't as good i guess as post frame if i'm not i'm not remembering correctly because i used it only like one time to try it out but um if you want to have the actual post frame experience you can use this uh, to do that so let's um let's try this out really quickly um is it on melpa or do i have to just pull this directly from the repo let's try it anyway let's go to the emacs session we have open here straight use package uh, Vertico, post frame. Well, first of all, let's try to see if it's in Melpa. And I may have to pull the repos again first. Straight pull recipe resp repositories. Okay, let's try this out first and see what happens. All right, so um, what's, what's going on in the chat here? <coughs> Excuse me. Benoit says it's similar to Ace Windows 2. Yeah, I, I, I think that was also written by Abo Abo. So it's got a similar uh, concept in mind. Oh, I'm in the wrong place pulling stuff. I'm in my main Emacs session. Great. Let's see how long this takes. Come on. Come on. Just waiting for it to unlock. All right, there we go. Whoa, what just happened? All right, okay, let's see here. Um, Super I. There we go. All right, so it's not there, but let's check Melpa first. Straight pull recipe repositories. Okay. You know, let's not even bother with that because oh, I already started it. Never mind. <laughs> Let's pull it out like this. All right, so repo uh, to my shoe, vertigo, post frame, post GitHub. I'm guessing GitHub is probably the default on that, but let's do this anyway. Did the stream hang for a moment? Yeah. I should have ran the command and nested Emacs. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I don't catch it before it happens. Wow. Yeah, I saw there was a little bit of a hang in the stream. That's great. Hi, Krishna. All right, so uh, let's turn on, uh, let's turn off Elmo mode first. Let's turn, whoa. Yeah, do it. Uh, Vertico mode back on. Vertico post frame mode. Okay, so now if I were to use Meta X, we get a nice little pop-up window here. It seems to work with my key bindings, which is great. And uh, this is a pop-up frame that's floating on top of the Emacs frame that I started it from. So, um, it doesn't take up, it doesn't change the window configuration of the uh, current screen, which is great. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically all it does. It just does it as a pop-up and uh, keeps you from having to change your window configuration. So if I turn that back off again and then use Control X B, you can see that it, you know, it moves the window up. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you've ever used like Rofi before, it's kind of a menu selection program that people use in you know custom Linux desktop environment configurations. This is sort of reminiscent of Rofi because you have this pop-up that shows up on the screen. So if you're using EXWM, it's kind of nice 
but um, there is some extra configuration you need to do before this will work correctly with EXWM. I wonder where I saw that documentation. Was it on the Ivy post frame repo? Let me check that out really quickly. There's, there's a little extra config you have to do to make it work correctly with um, with EXWM. Let's see, does he mention it here? EXWM, oh, come on, EXWM, no. It's probably in the, the issues. Issues two, uh, not working after EXWM related update. Maybe it's fine now, I don't know. Okay, interesting. I'm not gonna try it with EXWM because I don't want to uh, break everything, but uh, yeah, so Ella says, EXWM users with the correct config, you can make post frame frames act as a regular window. That's basically what you're trying to do. I think it's basically you're setting the parent to nil so that it doesn't try to lock into the, um, uh, the current EXWM frame because <clears throat> it will cause uh, problems. Let's see. Hey, Simon and uh, Wind Up Boy. Nice to see you. Hey, Bill. Let's see. Uh, Kateru says, can you make a packaging tutorial for geeks? Yes, I'm going to do that at some point. Uh, Stefan says, I tried the same with setting parent to nil and calculating the exact position of the frame for EXWM. Yeah, that's basically what you have to do. You have to set the parent to nil and sometimes set the position. But uh, yeah, I had the same thing in my config to Ellis, and I, I think I deleted it because I stopped using Ivy. So I got rid of all my Ivy related config, but it's in my history somewhere. But yeah, um, if you're using Vertico and you want a post frame like experience, then uh, Vertico post frame is definitely something you should check out if you want to, to do that. Let me get out of here now. Ah, oh, come on. Control shift R or is it control super R? Here we go. Okay. Next, uh, blamer.el. So I don't know if you've used VS Code. I mean, I won't tell anybody if, if you don't tell them that I use VS Code at some point. Um, <laughs> there's a package called Get Lens, Get Lens for VS Code, which has a really cool feature, which is basically whenever you move your cursor around to various lines in the uh, buffer that you're editing, if that buffer is part of a Git repository, it will give you information like a, an overlay on that line telling you the last person who edited that line, how long ago it was. And um, yeah, and maybe the commit message as well. And that can be really helpful for um, quickly knowing when a particular line was added to a file for your Git repository. <clears throat> so some nice person named uh, Arta Wauer made a similar package for Emacs called blamer.el. And it looks you know, effectively the same, same kind of functionality, which is great. I have not tried this yet, but I'm very interested to try it because I think it's a uh, useful functionality for sure. So you can see here in the demo, maybe the screen is a little bit too small for that, uh, but there's some information being shown. Uh, but let me go and uh, drop this configuration in to our uh, Emacs config and try it out. Uh, Ellis, uh, YouTube is extremely, <coughs> excuse me, YouTube is extremely um, strict about any links that get pasted in. I don't know why. All right, so I don't know why that's defer 20, but I guess it makes sense. I'll take that out for now. Um, all right, so we will just eval that. Let me do super I again. Uh-oh, cannot find package blamer. Uh, I got to update the recipe repos. Let's say straight recipe repository. So let's let's let that do its job for a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, if you want to see Alice's configuration for um, uh, Ivy post frame that does this right in EXWM, check out the link in general on the Discord, System Crackers Discord. All right, let's see if this is finished yet. Okay, maybe it's finished. Let's try this one more time. Cannot find package blamer. Okay. Um, let's just use a direct uh, link anyway. So I will do straight. Let's see if this works. Straight um, blamer repo Arta Wower uh, host GitHub. Uh, that should be it, right? Okay, cool. Failed to run Git to see. What? Can't run git. <clears throat> git branch r failed to run. Oh, whoop. 
I uh, made a mistake here. Blamer.el. There we go. Cloning Blamer.el. Okay, two different recipes for Blamer. Well, just, you know, figure it out. Ella says, I used to post frame all the things. Post frame, it's a nice idea, but when it starts flaking out, it really disrupts things, um, in my opinion. Come on, are you finished? Doesn't take that long. That repository can't be that that large. Unless it's like an internet thing now. Building, wow, that took forever. Okay, it's done. So now, let me get rid of this window. And um, I will go to a file in my dot files. Let's say dot emacs dot d slash, uh, well, tangle.files let's try that one and then is it on global uh blamer mode disabled enabled interestingly it's not working for me yet i'm not sure if i did something else that's wrong we need a blamer blamer now that's for sure all right let me see um let's go back to the uh Documentation, oh, idle time, min offset. Some of these things may need to be changed. Maybe that's the problem. Okay. Let's try this. Uh, I can't do control HV, what's going on? Wow, okay. All right. Global blamer mode. Is there like a local mode for this too? Blamer mode? No. It's fine. Uh, global blamer mode. Ugh, I'm in the wrong config again. Um, I have to remember my keys for switching EXW and input modes. All right, here we go. Uh, blamer mode. Okay, there is a local blamer mode as well. Disabled in the current buffer, enabled in the current buffer. Um, I can't really tell like what it's doing. Blamer mode T, blamer type both, overlay, idle time, max lines. Min offset, minimum symbols before insert commit info. I don't even know what that means. It's got some format stuff. So it should have popped it up already. I don't know if there's a problem with uh, pulling the information from Git for this file for some reason. If I were to use um, Magit Blame, I think, come on. Yeah, I might check messages. Um, so I'll press B. Oh, that would explain why we're not having any output because it's not a tracked file. So let's try to find something else. I'm trying to think there's something, okay. Yeah, I'll go to my Lisp folder and look at, uh, let's say, I guess all of these are probably generated, aren't they? Hmm. Okay, something's happening, I think. There we go. Okay, so there is a face that gets added in here at some um, column. Wow. What is happening? It's super slow. I mean, it's probably my fault somehow, but uh, somehow I can't actually move the cursor down past that line once it shows up. That's very interesting. I wonder if it um, uses something that breaks evil modes uh, line traversal because I'm using like visual lines for this. That's interesting. All right, let's go back to emacs.org. Can I not? Oh, sorry. I need to go back to scratch buffer. Um, height 140. I guess it's too small for this screen. So let's make it 220. That's probably going to be a mistake, but we'll find out soon. Go back to DW settings. Okay, so that seems a bit better. Can I control the column? Blamer, column. Minimum symbol. So maybe that's what that means, is that that's the column at which it inserts that information. So column 70 may be too wide, but that's probably just because on my screen currently, I don't have a whole lot of space. So it's better if I'm uh, in a full screen window, I think. 
and also my uh, navigation keys seem to be working better now, but maybe it's because it's not wrapping. Yeah, th there's something wrong here. Maybe it's a bug that is specific to evil mode and the particular configuration that I'm using. But uh, yeah, I mean, it is something if you are interested in that kind of functionality, then uh, you can certainly use that. See, control N, control P, whoopsie, don't want to do that. Settings, settings. Yeah, I definitely broke that now. Anyway, uh, let's turn that back off. Global blamer mode. Cool, all right. Anything else worth talking about here? I think it's useful to have a package like this because it can give you some, um, some insight into the code that you're working on. Oftentimes I need to find out when something was added in some code that I'm working on or maybe who added it, you know, like if I'm you know, working with teammates and I want to ask somebody a question about why a certain change was made. Uh, this can be helpful, but you can still use the general uh, blame functionality of Magit, etc. for this. Like I was trying to do before Magit blame, and then press B, and then it gives you the same information. It just has like these sections in the file where it says who made that particular change. I wonder what happens if I do that in one of my org mode files. Probably won't work very well, but let's take a look at it. Uh, Emacs.org. Let's try uh, Magit Blame on that because I think it's going to be pretty funny. Oh, okay. It's not being displayed the way that I normally display it, so probably it'll be fine. But uh, Magit Blame, B. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> a lot of changes in this file. Wow. Loading a lot of information. Let's get out of there. Uh, let's see, Magit, Blame, is it like quit? Yeah, Control-C, Control-Q. All right, let's get out of there. Control-X-V-G, so that's the built-in VC mode stuff. Control-X-V-G, uh, annotate emacs.org. Okay, whoa. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, VC mode is something I really need to get into. I need to figure out um, how to use that effectively because I think it's nice to have that behavior built in, but uh, I have not really spent enough time with it to get a good workflow going with it. All right, let's uh, jump here. Back to the notes. Uh, another uh, new package by a System Crafters community member, uh, Pavel Koritov, who is here right now. Uh, it's a package for uh, running Pomodoro timers in Emacs if you want to um, sort of constrain the amount of time that you're spending on certain tasks. So uh, let me open this one up really quickly. There's a few different packages for this certain type of functionality or the same type of functionality, but um, it's always good to look at an, a different one just to see if, you know how it may be done differently. Uh, so we're gonna try to install this in a moment. Wow, I can see the stream freezing a little bit here. That's great. Um, let's see. So this package uses transient for setting up Pomodoros, which is kind of nice because you can control things a little bit better that way. Wow. I hope the stream does not look like that because it's terrible. All right. So the preferred way to install this is by using, uh, use package straight.el basically like we've been doing so far with everything. So let's, uh, set that up really quick in our Emacs config. Go back to scratch buffer. Did I delete everything? Oh, no, that's the wrong scratch buffer. Okay. Scratch. Okay, let's jump down to the bottom, paste that in. All right. Control X, Control E. All right, so we're cloning pom.el here, and we will uh, give it a shot in just a moment. Thanks, wind up boy. I'm glad it looks okay for you folks, because I think that maybe it's just... Uh, downstream bandwidth problems on my side. So hopefully it's not too bad. All right, so POM is ready. Uh, let's try running just POM. So let's see. So now we have a, a, a transient at the bottom here that gives us some uh, suggestions. Karthik says transient is gonna be everywhere in Emacs in a few years. Well, definitely because it's uh, gonna be built in now, but it's, it's super useful for things like this where you wanna you know, like quickly configure a command that's about to be run. Um, so let me see if I can see short break period, long break period, work period, uh, start the timer. I would press S. Okay. So now it says we have uh, a timer iteration. Number one state work started at this time, time remaining. Um, I press Q to quit. Okay, cool. I don't know if it's got like a, 
do we have any kind of like readout on what the timer currently is? Palm, transient, start, stop, reset. Let's try that again. Time remaining. So it, it is clicking down a timer, but I don't see it in the mode line. Maybe that's something that you have to configure. Let me actually uh, check the docs. Stop, start running. Um, customization, uh, so that you can set alerts, which is nice. All right, here we go. Add to the list mode line misc info uh, for the current mode line string. And you probably need to add these hooks to make sure that the mode line updates while the timer is clicking down. So let's go and add those as well config so we'll just do it this way um let me do some manual indentation which everybody loves to see me do all right so now we can see that there is the timer clicking down here on the mode line which is great probably um what you does that what does you do update ah okay so the buffer can be refreshed by pressing you it makes sense it would be nice to have like a uh, minor mode as, as a part of POM, I think that would allow you to have that mode line get added to the, sorry, the timer get added to the mode line and hook up all those hooks, but that's, you know, a simple thing to add. Uh, Pavel says, because I didn't figure out how to auto, up, uh, auto update the transient. Yeah, I don't think there is a way to do that, so it makes sense. All right, but uh, yeah, it's pretty nice for being able to run a Pomodoro, so I can say POM stop, or maybe let's say pause. Let's pause it for now. And uh, the timer stops running there, uh, palm stop. Now, I think if we go back to the palm buffer, it gives us a history, like a readout of the times that we did uh, run a timer. And it tells me here that I ran a timer for, I guess, one minute. I don't know if that's the, um, the number of the timer or if that's the actual time that the timer ran for. Um, but you can set things like the work period, so if I, if I set uh, dash W, it'll ask me for how long I want to work for, so maybe 45 minutes. And I think that probably sets it for all the timers that you run uh, from this point forward. And if you know anything about the Pomodoro method, or maybe if you don't, um, there's an idea that you have a certain number of work periods uh, that have breaks in between, short breaks, and then after this number of work periods, you have a long break. So let's say you want to run 25 minute timers um, after every timer pops, you have a five minute break for you to you know, like get up, go get some water or something, come back, sit down, and then another timer will start. And then after four of these, at least by this configuration, uh, you will have a long break of let's say 25 minutes or some other amount of time. So if you want it to like really control and lock in your workflow and you know make sure you're spending only a certain amount of time on tasks, um, then this is one way to do that. And I kind of like that as a way to focus myself to say, all right, I only, only want to spend 25 minutes on doing this one thing. Cause you know, if you don't constrain the amount of time you spend, then you're just going to sort of like, you know, float around looking at stuff on the internet, maybe, you know, hopping into the system cutters IRC you know, doing all that kind of stuff and not really focusing. So, uh, having a timer set up is a good way to, uh, to help with that problem. So, um, another thing that you could probably do here, is uh, this, whoops, let's get out of there. So palm on status changed hook. If you really wanna make sure that you focus, you can uh, hook up a function to the on status changed hook, probably check the status of a whether there's a timer running or not, and then you know disconnect yourself from things or kill applications that are distracting. So um, nice to have that there so you can help yourself to be productive. <coughs> HD, thank you very much. All right, um, I think that was the last thing I had on the list today. Let me just run one more timer to, uh, to show this a little bit. So 25, we'll say number of work periods before a long break. I'm going to say one because I'm lazy. And then I'll start a timer and we'll see what happens. So nothing else really on my agenda for the day. So we can kind of just chill out for a bit. And if you have any other um, things that you know of that have come up recently in the Emacs community, at least while I've been gone, let, cer certainly feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, actually, one thing I will take a look at is something Karthik mentioned to me that I did see in the um, Emacs news recently. Let me try to get out of this window really quick. Is... Um, what was it called? Well, let's just go back to Emacs News. I don't know if I have that pulled up right now. See ya, Pavel. Thanks for being here. All right, so 
what it was called. Uh, Cap F auto suggest. Okay, that's the one. History auto suggestions for comment and e shell. So, um, if you've ever used fish shell before, if you haven't, give it give it a shot because it's interesting. It's different than uh, Bash or Z shell, etc. It's a little bit more um, user friendly. Uh, one of the features that it has, which is pretty useful, is the ability to, well, while you're typing command in the shell, it will look at the history of commands you've typed and it will sort of auto-complete or at least suggest, suggest an auto-completion from your history uh, as you're typing in the, the command. And uh, I've been using a package to have a similar behavior for eShell called, uh, well, what, was it, what is it called? ESH auto suggest. So I do have a package for that, but that only works for eShell. So someone wrote a package that does this not only for eShell, but also for shell mode and I think term mode as well. So if you want to have general functionality for this in various shells, then this is one way to do that. Um, so let's actually try this out really quick. Is there a readme or anything for this? Let me see tree. No, but maybe if we look at the file itself, we can uh, get a hint on how to use it. So install the package. It looks like it's maybe in Melpa already or potentially Elpa. Yeah, okay, it's, it's Free Software Foundation, so I'm guessing that's in Elpa. So we can install that in our Emacs config. So if we go into eShell right now, whoops, let me do super i, eShell, then um, I don't know if I have any history for shell history list history okay so there's some stuff in here that's good so um, CD so no, you don't see anything showing up after I type in CD right now but if we go back into our uh, scratch buffer we straight use package cap F uh, auto was it called auto suggest yeah auto suggest control X control E all right so it's pulling it now from Elpa which is great all right, so it's turn, it's uh, downloaded, and now we can go back to eShell, turn on cap F auto suggest mode, and then, um, well, it's giving me a suggestion already. I didn't type anything yet. I'll type CD, and it automatically comes up with the suggestion to go to this uh, Rome notes daily. So is there a way? Okay, so there's a command called cap F auto suggest accept, where if you run that, if you bind it to some key binding, it will automatically fill in the rest of that text. So it's a, a nice way to really quickly complete something that is from your history. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm guessing that must be the last thing that I ran here. Uh, it's auto automatically showing it up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Any configuration stuff here? Let's see, cap F functions. All completions only one. Yeah, so there's, there's a few different things here. Probably there's uh, bindings first uh, going up and down in the suggestions list as well, which is pretty useful. But um, the point here is that if we run, uh, let's say term mode, I don't know if term mode is gonna work, but we're gonna find out. Whoops, not term mode, I'm sorry for that. Let's see, term. We're gonna run bash. Uh, let's turn on cap F uh, auto suggest mode here. Oh, come on. Control C, what is it? Control C, control, huh? Let me full screen this. I can't remember exactly how to use this. Okay, uh, auto suggest mode. Okay, so it's not working here. Control R, no. But it probably will work in shell mode because it's a comment uh, buffer, so shell. So if I turn on cap F auto suggest mode, yes, yeah, CD shows up. I don't know what else it would have in its own history. So shell history, no. Uh, CD, let's see, CD, oh, okay. So, so something did show up there, which that's great. Interesting, I'm pressing control F and it fills in all that stuff, which is cool. So um, I'm guessing it would also work for any other thing, like maybe even a REPL. It's possible that a REPL buffer could uh, work with this, so. Could be useful for people who use a lot of REPLs or, you know, eShell, etc. 
Uh, GK Sudo says, I've been leaning towards eShell as the main term shell recently. Works great for my needs. Yeah, I mean, for pretty much everything that I do, it works just fine. Uh, there are some commands that I run for stuff that I work on in my day job. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I have to use vterm instead because it requires having a more complete terminal emulation experience. But um, yeah, for pretty much everything else, I'm using uh, eShell. And I don't really even use the shell that much anyway. I mean, I'm running like geeks commands through the shell, but uh, you know, I do all my Git operations through Magit. And uh, I do a lot of file management stuff through DRED. So I use a shell less and less these days. So eShell is nice to use if you just need uh, to run shell commands uh, in Emacs. Let's see. Um, Ellis says, if you do use eShell, some cool guy has done a powerline prompt framework. <clears throat> I think that's what, P10K? Oh, yeah, you actually said it here. There it is, yeah. Yeah, so let's look that up really quickly. I haven't used that, but I know that uh, Ellis wrote that um, some time ago. GitHub. So I'll uh, copy that into the show notes for those who are interested. So if you want to have a nice looking prompt in eShell, you can use this eShell P10K uh, library or package for Emacs that will give you a nice power line looking prompt, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. Apparently I have not started this repo, so I'll do that now. Um, let's go back to my config or to my notes. Uh, let's see. Put that in an, another other links section. And also a new package. I'll put the uh, capf auto suggest here. Automatically suggest command history. <clears throat> oh, let me grab the repo for that. There we go. Let's see. Hi, Auntie Carol. Was watching Cricket. That's cool. Uh, Kateru says, how do you get key map completions? Uh, you're probably talking about uh, which key, right? So I use which key in that Emacs config. It's a package called which key. If you press like control C, it will give you, oh, come on, control C. Let's go back to the scratch buffer. Oh, no, once again, I need to press super I again. All right, control C, and then you get all these um, suggestions for the next key in the key map. That's just a package called which key. In my personal config, I'm using Embark for that whole uh, process now because it's um, it's got a nice uh, mode for, if you press control C, it doesn't show you that list anymore, but if you press control H, it gives you a, a completion list for uh, the commands that are in the key map in any level below that, which is pretty awesome. I kind of like that a lot. So I've been using that instead of uh, which key recently. You know, a lot of things I learned about Embark recently. So that was a, a pretty cool find. Let's see anything else interesting. Let's see if I miss anything in the chat. So, you know, maybe I'll just talk about what my thoughts are on <clears throat> uh, my own Emacs configuration, what I plan to do in the near future, and also um, thoughts on covering Emacs stuff in general on the channel and in, in the near future. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about sort of changing the way that I do my Emacs config, partially because of uh, being a little bit tired of dealing with org mode literate config files. I did a stream maybe three weeks ago where I was trying to come up with a something called an, like an inverse literate configuration where it basically you write your code as code or your configuration as code, not as org files, but you could generate an org file or a website out of it. I'm still thinking about doing something on those lines. Uh, I've got some ideas in mind, but I'm not sure whether it makes sense yet. Um, but it's, I, I kind of like the idea of going back to just writing code files again. So I'm going to experiment with that a bit and maybe I'll talk about it more as I go, um, as I go on with that. Um, but uh, Geeks Home sort of throws a wrench in the works a little bit because 
if you tr want to adopt Geeks Home, you kind of need to do more and more things using Geeks Home because you don't get the benefits of Geeks Home if you don't do things its own way. So by that I mean, whenever you make changes to your configuration, you should run Geeks Home Reconfigure to apply that configuration so that it can be rolled back if you break anything. Now, um, at first, I was thinking it's kind of crazy to pull your Emacs configuration into Geeks Home so that um, if you want to apply configuration changes, you actually have to apply it through Geeks Home and not just through editing your init.el file. Um, I'm still not sure yet whether I would try to go so far as to apply Emacs config changes through Geeks Home, but I know that uh, Andrew Tropin does it, the, the, the guy who made um, Geeks Home itself and the RDE repo. I'm willing to try it, but I'm not really there yet. I, I'm still like figuring out how to build my own Geeks Home configuration. So in the future, my Emacs and Geeks Home configurations may be a little bit more intermingled. However, the problem with that is it's not so easy to use that same config on Mac OS and Windows anymore because if I have to use Geeks to apply it, then it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't work on Windows or Mac OS because Geeks is not there. So I have to be a little bit careful with that. However, if uh, WSL 2 and this WSL G thing works correctly in Windows 11, which I do have now, then maybe it doesn't matter anymore because I could actually use Geeks uh, and run the Linux version of Emacs in Windows. So maybe it doesn't matter that much anymore, but it really, I have to figure all this out. So, sort of the process of system crafting is like you have some ideas, you try things out, you try to see if it works, and then you decide that it's a failure and you roll back. But, uh, you know, Part, part of me making content for this channel is trying new weird things. So that's something I'm planning to do in the future. Um, and I there's a lot of dead weight, I think, in my config that I still need to take out. I did clean a lot of that up recently as I uh, converted my use package config to setup.el. Um, there's some bugs still in my config after that conversion as well. There's like some patterns I need to smooth out a little bit, but um, I I'm I think I'm pretty happy with the fact that I did switch to setup.el, um, but you know, time will tell, I guess, if it's the right decision. But you know, I had to try it out and see what happens. Um, and then also on the topic of like you know covering Emacs content on the channel, I do kind of want to branch out a little bit more. You know, this talk I'm doing about, or sorry, the the what I was saying earlier about covering Guile scheme is part of that, you know, I want to sort of branch out a little bit more into more general system crafting, but with an eye for doing things yourself. I mean, obviously we could look at other tools. I mean, I don't really want this to turn into one of those other Linux channels where we're just covering whatever random window manager or tool that is out there. I want to focus more on building stuff um, and using lisps for this purpose. So, um, Covering Guile Scheme and then figuring out how to use it for what you might call systems programming, you know, actually doing things where you're interacting, doing things where you're interacting with your system, maybe building tools as part of your whole system configuration. Um, I want to get more into that. And obviously, Geeks is a big part of it as well because all of your configuration in Geeks is written with Guile Scheme. So I think we might start floating a little bit more outside of the sphere of Emacs. We'll still cover Emacs, you know every week, every other week, whatever, but maybe the, the focus won't be so heavily on Emacs anymore as it was, so. Uh, Ella says, why awesome is the best window manager? Yeah, I, I really don't want to get into that kind of content production because there's plenty of people doing it already, and I really, I can't do this unless it's something that I'm interested in, so I'm not going to be going and trying every window manager because I've already done that. I mean, like, maybe five, six, seven years ago, I was trying to various window managers, but now I'm not so interested in going and changing up my whole configuration all the time. So I really feel like focusing more on crafting a system configuration and your own tools using really good stuff like Guile Scheme and Geeks makes more sense for you know the, the new trajectory of things. However, we're not going away from covering Emacs because Emacs is a very core part of my own configuration and setup. So we're going to continue talking about packages. There's plenty of packages that I want to talk about. We still need to get, kind of go in more depth on Emacs Lisp at some point. Um, and there's various different 
things that we haven't covered yet that I still need to get to. So I think what I'll do is sort of mix in various topics about Emacs with this uh, new focus on, <clears throat> excuse me, Guile Scheme and Geeks, etc. So still figuring that out. But, um, you know, to keep things fresh and interesting for me, I need to continue looking at new stuff and uh, spending some time uh, talking about uh, Geeks and uh, Guile Scheme would be helpful. Also, I think it's going to be nice for people to get more involved in contributing to Geeks because Geeks does not have the same limitations that you have with Emacs where you have to do copyright assignment. Uh, you do not have to do copyright assignment to contribute to Geeks. In fact, if you go look at the source code for Geeks, you'll see all the individual copyrights from all the contributors to all the source files, which means that it is more free to contribute to than Emacs, which is kind of strange to think about, but it is. So if I help people learn how to use Guile Scheme and I help people learn how to write service configurations or write package configurations, then maybe we'll have a lot more people contributing to Geeks itself or to the various channels that you can pull into your Geeks config. And we'll have a lot, uh, a more rich ecosystem of packages and tools to choose from. So that's sort of one problem we have right now. It's hard to find certain programs because somebody has to package them or maybe certain drivers you need to use because somebody hasn't gone to the trouble yet to set them up. Um, helping people learn how to do that kind of thing might actually broaden the community some. There's been a few people who have tried Geeks uh, as a result of watching the videos or talking to me about it on you know Discord or IRC, and they've gone to make their own package configs or do really useful stuff. So I want to see more of that happening. And I think that you know covering Guile is going to do um, a good job of that. Thank you so much, Rodislav, for the uh, five euro and su super chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, Rostislav, sorry. Uh, GK Suda says, I think uh, Geeks Guile ties in quite well with the channel. Yeah, I we're we're kind of a weird channel <clears throat> because we're talking mostly about Lisp focused system configuration topics and also using Emacs. But I think it's a, a nice ni nice niche to have. I like. Lisp languages. I spent a lot of time uh, playing with Lisp and Scheme, and hopefully in the future closure. So um, it it makes a lot of sense to me to focus a lot on that area and uh, not really veer off into stuff that's unrelated entirely to all this. Ellis says contributing to Geeks is so simple. Yeah, it is pretty straightforward. However, I guess one downside is that sometimes it takes a while for someone to respond to a patch that you send. So um, I guess it's the same thing with any big project. You know, you'll have to kind of push a little bit maybe to get people to help get it merged or maybe make friends with a maintainer of the project that can help merge your stuff in. <clears throat> GK Sudo says, very much interested in Guile, even though being a Gen 2 user. Well, I mean, um, Guile is very useful as a scripting language and also for building larger applications. I mean, if Geeks is any indication you can make real software with guile so um definitely it's a useful tool to have in your in your tool belt steve says is there a geeks version of the arch wiki um not really i mean we tried to start writing some stuff about uh, geeks in the system cutters wiki but you know there's not a whole lot of information there yet so if you want to help build something like that for geeks we could definitely do it at the system cutters wiki or maybe try to help get an actual wiki started for geeks somewhere. There may be that something for that. I'm not sure. Um, but if, if you know about something like that, definitely let me know. But um, it would be nice to have a very comprehensive uh, wiki, sort of like ArchWiki, because that's a, an, an excellent resource. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's see. Yuka says, uh, Lisp, but no fight between dynamic versus lexical binding. Well, uh, Scheme is more of a uh, lexical binding language. And it's also a Lisp 1. Does it have a separate nas namespace for variable, <coughs> excuse me, variables and procedures, which I like. Uh, Ellis says the uh, the handbook exists. Yeah, the cookbook is uh, is one place where you can add information, but uh, I don't really see it get updated very often, but I don't really follow it either. Let's see, what else is worth talking about? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in continuing with my Geeks Home config. I'll tell you one thing that um, I would like to have in Geeks Home that, I, that isn't there yet, but I think there has been some talk about it, which is... Um, the ability to have separate profiles for different packages that can be updated separately. 
I'm not sure how that would work with Geek's Home because the idea is that you're applying a single configuration to your user profile or to your home folder, basically. And having separate profiles that get installed and updated separately sort of goes against that idea. Uh, but it, it is really nice to have the ability to update certain packages uh, less frequently than others. Like let's say ungoogled Chromium or maybe Firefox if you've installed Firefox from uh, the uh, nine geeks repo, because if you need to re rebuild those packages, it can take forever. So, so I typically do not update my browsers very frequently. I have a separate profile for my browsers so that I don't like, you know, hose my system every time I want to update everything. But if you use geeks home and you have all your packages being pulled into one single profile, then you have to install them all every single time that you want to reconfigure your, uh, your home configuration. So I don't know, like I've, I haven't found a good solution for that yet. I basically resorted to installing browsers using my, using geeks install, which is like your default profile and then installing all my other packages that don't take so long to install with uh, geeks home. So not ideal, but at least it gives me a little bit more flexibility. Ella says, can you not pin packages in geeks home? Maybe with inferiors, uh, but I'm not exactly sure. I would have to look into it. It would be nice if that was the case. <clears throat> Case says, I want to know when a Lisp 3 is going to come out. Well, it may already exist. I'm not sure. Alejandro says, maybe an org room geeks. Yeah, that could be helpful. Um, but uh, that's, it, you know, the thing about having an org mode based website for people to, con to contribute to is that it's harder for people to make contributions to an org site than it is to just go and edit a wiki page because there's like a built-in UI, you just go click an edit button, you go edit your text and then you save it and you're done. Um, for an org based site like the System Crafters Wiki, someone has to go and clone the repo or go to the you know GitHub page and click edit and it's not so smooth. But um, it's doable, it's just, you know, it, it, the thing that is not doable is doing an org roam site editing via the GitHub UI. So anybody who'd want to come and contribute to your org roam based wiki would have to clone your repo and then use org roam with a specific configuration potentially and then make their edits and then contribute those things back via a pull request. And that seems a little bit um, painful. Oh boy, we have some, uh, some nice spammer scammers here. Let's see if I can get rid of these people. <clears throat> Yeah, all right. Let's block in uh, restream chat, but it's not blocking on Twitch probably. <coughs> all right, uh, cheese, cheese says, excuse me, I can't speak anymore, it's late. Uh, Geek seems intimidating, but I'm planning on trying on a VM once I get bored of video games. Well, the problem with video games is that you'll get bored and then a new game will come out and then it will start sucking your attention again. So uh, definitely make the most of your time whenever you're bored with games. Right now, I don't have my Xbox, so I don't have that excuse. Uh, Ella says, time to get Twitch YouTube mods. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to do that for sure, because I can't watch all the the chats at the same time. Unfortunate, but true. Let's see, is there anything else interesting? Yeah, I think that's pr probably it for the day. I mean, you know, I wanted to get back into streaming again. Uh, because, you know, it, it is a little bit difficult after taking a couple weeks off to try to like motivate yourself to get back into doing something like streaming or making videos. Uh, but, you know, I would call today's stream a success from that standpoint. I feel good about, you know, being able to come and hang out with you all again and, uh, and chat about stuff, which is great. Uh, as far as um, videos are concerned, I'm going to try to make the next video in the org website series uh, this week. <laughs> Start a long break, yes, or in the Pomodoro. Okay. Nah, let's just end it. Um, I think the next one's going to be about how to style and customize the uh, org site. I need to go look at what stuff is available for that with the inbuilt HTML uh, exporter, though. So we'll see whether I uh, follow through with that specific promise. Um, but... I do want to try to get a video out video out this week on that topic, and then we'll figure out sort of what we'll talk about next. 
Um, plenty of things that we can talk about uh, in the end. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve says, that's why I game on an old ThinkPad so I eventually get bored of video games. Well, you definitely can't do much gaming on that. But let me tell you, you know, if you just use uh, like GNOME Mahjong in Linux, then you're going to be screwed for a while. That or uh, I'll Riot Solitaire. That's my problem. Is if I open up Solitaire, I'm stuck. Uh, Ellis says, time to play MX Tetris all day. Yeah, that is also an option. Alejandro says, uh, exactly, that's my idea. Keep it to who actually knows what they're talking about, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. Um, that is one way to keep it to people who know what they're doing, I guess, is to have the website not be editable by any random person who drops by, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't like to block people who would ordinarily want to contribute if they don't know exactly how to do that. So Eric says, how is EXWM maintenance now? Um, there is a new maintainer, or at least the, um, the co-maintainer has now been promoted to main maintainer and is able to merge PRs and, and ship stuff. So, um, we we're out of the darkness, I think, as far as EXWM is concerned, which is great. Crazy Chicken says the free software games written in Guile. There's so many. Well, um, <clears throat> that's actually another good reason to learn Guile because there's a few libraries for doing game programming with Guile. Um, now, there are people who will tell you that you should not use a Lisp language or a garbage collected language for game development, but uh, you can get pretty far, I think. I mean, if you're doing like a AAA 3D game, you probably don't want to use Guile Scheme, but for two-dimensional games or you know text-based games or things like that, you could definitely use Guile Scheme for that. There is a... A uh, library called uh, Chicka D, which is um, an SDL2 binding for Guile Scheme. Let's see. Uh, made by David Thompson, who is a prolific uh, Guile Scheme hacker. And uh, it's a nice library that can get you started off really quickly for uh, doing game development with Guile Scheme. So if you want an, uh, a reason to play around with game development and uh, you want to use Guile Scheme for that, then check out Chickadee. Uh, I think Chickadee uses another library under the covers for the SDL stuff, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it does seem to be actively uh, updated. Uh, like, even October, there was a new release on this, so... Uh, worth taking a look at. You know, Guile is a cool language. Uh, and Scheme itself is very cool as well. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, Common Lisp and whatnot, but I think Scheme is uh, pretty awesome, so... Something to look into. <clears throat> uh, Case says Minesweeper is better than Solitaire. Hot take. Well, I don't know. Certainly, you could make that case. Hey, Minas Mazar. Let's see. What did I miss here? Uh, Love also works quite well with Fennel. Yeah, yeah. So that's another um, game programming li library for Lua that you can use with the Fennel language, which is sort of like a closure like language that compiles to Lua or at least to the Lua JIT compiler, I guess. I'm not sure. Crazy Chicken says, I'm still playing with High as it's the only way I use Python nowadays. High seems pretty good too. <clears throat> she says, I want to write a Lucas style uh, adventure game in Lisp. You should definitely try that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. All right. So I'm going to start winding this stream down now so I can go eat some dinner. I think I'm going to get some uh, some souvlaki today, which is awesome. Going to go fill myself and maybe drink a beer or two and uh, relax in this nice uh, warm evening in Athens, Greece. So um, like I said, we'll try to have another video this week or uh, I guess the, the first video in a few weeks uh, this week. And then we'll continue on with the Friday streams from this point forward. Uh, if you have any ideas for things you would like to see covered in the Friday streams or as videos or whatever, please feel free as always to uh, drop me a line on uh, Twitter or Discord or uh, IRC or email, etc. You can find links to those things uh, in the chat and in the description below. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate uh, the nice uh, collection of folks who joined up today for the first stream in a while. It's uh, very nice to see you all today. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's it. GNU Ninja says NetHack is the only game you need. Yeah, NetHack, you can basically play for the rest of your life and maybe you'll beat it. Maybe you probably won't. <laughs> it's 
Kind of like a Dwarf Fortress, but even more cryptic. All right, folks. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching and happy hacking. We'll see you.